everybody and welcome to uh, this City and Guilds Customer Service Specialist Overview webinar this morning. Uh, my name is Dom Green. I'm the Technical Advisor for Business Skills at City and Guilds. Uh, I'm also joined this morning by Mandy Slaney, who's the Lead Industry Manager for Business Skills as well. Uh, Mandy is going to be jumping in um, if with anything of importance and will also be around to help with questions towards the end. Okay, so just a quick overview, first of all, of what today is going to be about. We're going to, first of all, give you a brief overview of the standard. Uh, so we're going to cover the, the, the assessment method. Um, we're then going to look at some feedback from the lead independent endpoint assessor, who's uh, very kindly given us some feedback. Um, look at the projects specifically. So we're going to focus quite a lot, quite heavily this morning on the actual project method of assessment. Um, so we're going to look at some su support in place with the projects, look at some, the timeline involved with that particular project, show you some uh, further support which is on the horizon before going into the questions at the very end. As per usual, if you've got a question, please feel free to, to type it into the questions box. Um, it might not get answered today. If it doesn't, we'll take them away and we will uh, form um, a bank of questions, of frequently asked questions, and we'll post them up on our website. Uh, so don't worry, you will get your question answered, if not today. Okay, so without further ado, the three components of endpoint assessment for customer service specialists then consist of a portfolio-based professional discussion, a work-based project with an interview, and normally a practical observation. Obviously, due to current climate, um, we presume that you are aware of uh, the dispensation which is being put in place, and that is a witness testimony, and of course that comes with Q&A. We'll look at the witness testimony a little bit more in detail. Okay, so before we can actually go and, con and consider endpoint assessment, we need to travel through Gateway. This is business as usual, so for anybody who's gone through Gateway pa in the past with any other, um, apprenticeships that then it's it's very similar so because it's a level three learners need to have achieved maths and english at level two and then the usual documentation needs to be uh, completed as well so gateway declaration form signed by all three parties the employer uh, the line manager sorry the employer the center or the ptp uh, and the, uh, the the apprentice themselves so EPA is the final stage um, of the apprenticeship um, and obviously everything should be complete now. So the portfolio should be complete at this stage uh, apart from the project. So as far as grading is concerned, um, for the learner to achieve a pass, uh, the, the learner must achieve a pass in all three assessment methods. If any of those three assessment methods aren't achieved, the apprentice would actually um, fail and would need to do a resit. In order to achieve a distinction, the apprentice must achieve, achieve a distinction in all three components. Okay, so if they had two distinctions and a pass, unfortunately, that would remain as a pass overall. So they do need to re do need to achieve uh, a distinction across the board. Okay, first things we're going to look at then is professional discussion, which is supported by a portfolio of evidence. Now, the portfolio of evidence is slightly different to customer service practitioner. It's very specific in what it asks for. It asks for a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 15 pieces of evidence. And that would be submitted um, no later than two weeks prior to the endpoint assessment actually happening. That portfolio of evidence then, it must be... Um, strongly um, the emphasis basically placed on that evidence is that that evidence in itself is not assessed it simply uses a tool for the professional discussion and it's the pd um, that will be assessed so again the portfolio is um, the usual collection of the apprentices best forming that holistic overview so over that on program duration what is the best pieces of work that the learners uh, completed and how does it holistically map against all the KSBs associated to the portfolio-based PD? We can't stress that enough. All of the KSBs must be evidence within that portfolio. Once the learner has submitted just their best, 
we're very much following the less is more approach here. So we want uh, the best examples once they are, have been achieved and input into that portfolio, that is it. Okay, so the less is more approach needs to be followed. We don't want mountains and mountains. The guidelines is specific 10 as a minimum, maximum 15. Once it's completed, you would submit that electronically to our e portal no less than two weeks before the endpoint assessment. So, what can go in that portfolio? It's business as usual, witness statements, you can have customer feedback in there, manager feedback, reflective accounts, PDPs, etc., etc. Okay, um, reports, observations, presentations, um, CPD logs. What we've got to do really is ask ourselves two questions. Does the evidence selected follow uh, the below? So first question, which pieces holistically and most effect efficiently give evidence that together cover all of the relevant criteria? And is this the best evidence the apprentice has? And does it show that they've met all the requirements for distinction grade? So it's not a requirement actually that they have to meet up to distinction, but obviously the learner needs to try and uh, wants to get the best possible opportunity out of that portfolio for the PD. And so if, if the evidence is there, which is meeting the distinction criteria, and not just the pass, they're obviously going to stand themselves in a better stead before the PD. That portfolio then must be cross referenced against the criteria um, on the relevant piece of evidence. So we must ensure that we've cross referenced each of the pieces of evidence of the portfolio to the KSBs within that assessment plan. Um, of course, that portfolio needs to formally declare that, the, uh, that it's authentic, uh, that the apprentice has done all of that evidence themselves. And then during EPA, um, the actual EPA itself can be done face-to-face -face or remotely. Now, obviously at the moment, um, many people are opting for remote for obvious reasons. If you do wish to have face-to-face, -face, you will need to ensure that the appropriate safeguarding and health and safety provisions put in place. We need to make sure then, um, if it is face-to-face, -face, that it's conducted in a suitable controlled environment. Is the IEPA safe? Is the apprentice safe? Is the employee safe? Uh, so that needs to be considered. If the apprentice is doing it within, a, say, a college or a PTP, um, is that a suitably controlled environment? Are they going to get distracted, for instance? It's not just about the health and safety. But prior to COVID, um, they still needed to make sure that it was completed in, a, an, in an environment that was conducive to the apprentice having the best opportunity. So people not walking in, not walking out uh, and not distracting them. So normally we would say that if it was face to face, uh, once the observation had been completed uh, and, and the PD was done, it would be done on the same day. Um, naturally, if it's remote, we would expect that anyway. The professional discussion would last 60 minutes with a tolerance of 10%. So you're looking at 66 minutes. And the documents that are to support that portfolio based PD for you um, is the portfolio referencing form, uh, which you must um, map all evidence to, the gateway declaration form, which needs to be signed by all three parties, so the employer, provider, and apprentice, the PD grade descriptors table, which is found in the EPA pack. And of course, the exemplar materials and preparation tool, which would can be found on the preparation tool tab under smart screen. And that's available once you've registered your apprentice. OK, briefly onto the work based project. Now, I have covered um, the uh, I've put in here the KSBs that the work based project needs to cover. Um, and we'll look at that in more detail later. So I'm going to come back to that slide. So the work-based project itself is slightly different. Uh, it's carried out after Gateway, and the apprentice has got two months in which to complete the actual project. Now, we've got to stress here, it is an actual project. It's not about just going away and doing a report. The apprentice must complete a project. Before the project can start, the apprentice must put together a proposal, and that proposal is 500 words long, and it should be about what the project is going to be on. We'll touch upon that later in the webinar. The final report um, should be created around that project, uh, and that should be 2,500 words in length, and again, with the 10% tolerance. And that would be submitted no later again than two weeks prior to the endpoint assessment. 
as per usual it's holistically assessed uh, and the grading is a fail pass or distinction we've also got to bear in mind as well that um, the interview that's attached to the project the apprentices response within that interview will be assessed as well as the content of the work-based project that interview then will focus on the written work um, the, uh, the written work uh, based project and any supporting annexes that the apprentice might have submitted as well. So the apprentice basically will be asked competency based questions by the independent endpoint assessor uh, around their work based project. And they may well or will probably be asked also in addition that, um, to some further questions which will also demonstrate competence as well. And again, um, Previous to COVID, we would have done that face to face, but during, due, during this current climate, we are also offering it remotely. Again, we need to make sure that the apprentice is not desert, dis, dis, disturbed in any way. So we need to make sure that it is in a suitable controlled environment again. So if they are coming into college or if they are coming into the, the training provider's premises, or they are doing it in the employer's premises, again, making sure that the health and safety is sufficient, that COVID guidelines are adhered to, but also that they're not going to get disturbed during their endpoint assessment. So as part of that project, how they would evidence what they've found in that project, they would write a report. Now, I'm not going to go through each one of these, um, but the learner must re write that report. We mentioned previously 2,500 words with 10% tolerance. And this is, these are the areas within that report that the learner must cover. And each of these areas can be found within the endpoint assessment pack found on the City and Guilds website. OK, so without going through all those bullet points about what the learner must cover, we'll go straight to the documents which need to, which are there to support. So there is a work based project proposal form uh, that is found in the uh, recording forms pack for centres. Uh, there, is, there is obviously the grade descriptors table within the EPA pack. And there's obviously the, the exemplar materials as well within smart screen that I mentioned previously on the preparation tab. Again, just to stress that in order to get access to those, the learner must be registered first. Once the learner regi is registered, you will then get a login to access the um, preparation tab, which sits in our smart screen package. OK, moving on to the practical observation and the witness testimony, which we mentioned previously. The practical observation um, must include customer interaction. What we'd, what we'd stress really is that it's uh, looking at uh, a range of day-to-day -day workplace activities within the apprentice's work and that interaction with at least three different customer types is seen. So what does that mean? Uh, it basically means that customers with varying needs are, are, are observed. So what we don't want to see is, for example, a learner being observed in a railway station with say uh, customers coming in at peak hours, buying a, a return ticket um, from London to Cambridge uh, and that's it. So sim a simple sale uh, would not be sufficient regardless if it was three, num three, type three customers or 20. We need to see different types of customers. So do they have different needs? Uh, are they asking um, about uh, timetables? Are they complaining? Are they buying uh, something um, uh, according to what it is at this source of, for example, a rail ticket? Uh, what is the varying needs of the customers? So it's really important then that when the observation is booked, uh, that the time of day is considered. We need to see the learner, the apprentice uh, being busy. Um, so try and book it at the peak time where possible. Further to that, further questions and answers will be carried out to seek further clarification to make sure that there is full understanding uh, within the observation. Um, so it might be that certain things are not observed within the observation. It's not a case of mopping up. It's more a case of um, ensuring that competency is there. So this is why it's so important really to make sure that the observation is booked at the busiest time um, because that q and is not to mop up what's missed necessarily. It's more about ensuring that the learner is competent at what it is they do. So that observation will last 60 minutes, again, with a 10% tolerance. Now, obviously, for obvious reasons, the observations are not necessarily taking part at the moment. 
and it has been replaced with the witness testimony as far as, far as dispensation is concerned. So that witness testimony then will still have a Q&A session around that witness testimony and this is a direct replacement to the observation so the learner the apprentice would not do both it's a direct replacement if you feel that observations cannot happen at this particular time then this is where the witness testimony comes into place so the witness testimony um, should state the, um, uh, the the name the job title the position of the witness so that would be from the employer's side to a line manager, for instance, and that needs to state on the actual documentation what their relationship is to the apprentice. We've got to stress here, I've put in there in a highlighted, uh, often missing, that the relationship to the apprentice uh, is, is often missed off that form. So it's really important that that is uh, highlighted within that documentation. The witness themselves then must work in a role equivalent to first line management. So it can't be a colleague on the same uh, level. Uh, it must be somebody who um, the apprentice might report into, for instance. For example, that might be a team leader. Um, so it can't be a colleague. Um, you need to state how the person had responsibility for that apprentice. And in order to conform to VAX, the witness must have worked with the apprentice for a minimum of three months during the course of their apprenticeship. And often, again, we need to stress that dates are often missing within that, within that documentation. So please do make sure that all dates are, are, are put in. So the witness needs to provide work-based examples of where the apprentice has demonstrated competency against the standard. And this is why it's important that the witness has worked with the apprentice for a minimum of three months. And the witness must sign the declaration to say that the examples they provided are actual and true accounts. As far as provider support and involvement is concerned, it's about supporting the employer. The employer may not know how to write a witness testimony. The provider will know how to do this. So this is where the support is really, really important. However, the employer must be the person who completes the documentation. That's not to say that the um, the provider can't support the employer prior to the employer actually writing out the witness testimony. Discuss by all means the evidence with the employer. Uh, make sure that the apprentice is on board. Essentially, we need to make sure that the apprentice knows what goes down in that witness testimony because they are going to have a Q&A around it at the end of it. So don't keep the apprentice out in the cold. Make it a, a, a tri-party, a three-way agreement, um, what evidence is going to go in there and why. It's also a really good practice to carry out a mock Q&A session with the apprentice prior to employment assessment. Now, it might be that the employer does that. It might be that the provider does that. It might be that really good practice both do that to really try and get the apprentice used to being um, going through the, an EP endpoint assessment with that Q&A. And of course, trying to predict the questions that would come around the evidence that you've already submitted. What I can't stress enough is that that witness testimony, because it replaces the observation, must cover all the criteria associated to the observation. So you need to make sure that that witness testimony maps across to all the case fees. Try and do that, or you must really do that before it's submitted. And that is really is the provider's responsibility uh, to check that that witness testimony does actually meet all the required criteria for the observation. So just to stress again, the witness testimony should cover all of the past criteria. And if the, if the apprentice is wanting a distinction and feels that they're capable of doing it, it must cover all the distinction criteria where possible as well. Obviously, not every apprentice is going to be able to do that. But where the apprentice can, you need to ensure that all the criteria is being met. So the witness testimony must showcase the apprentice's skills. The Q&A which follows only lasts a maximum of 30 minutes. So once that time frame is up, no more questions can be asked. So it's really important that the witness testimony covers all of the skills, um, all of the case bees associated with the observation, because that will then allow the Q&A to be an awful lot easier. And then the Q&A will really focus on just confirming competence within that, from that witness testimony, which should make the life of the apprentices uh, interview slightly uh, slightly easier really 
the more work the IEPA has to do, um, the more competence that has to be confirmed, the more questions will be asked really within that 30 minutes. And of course, if all competence hasn't been confirmed by the time that 30 minutes is up, then unfortunately the Q&A will stop. Okay, I'm not going to touch any more on that witness testimony dispensation. We did actually do um, a, a live webinar purely on the customer service witness testimony. And it does cover both level two practitioner and level three specialist. So rather than me repeat myself again, what I'm going to do is point you now in the direction of our website. And what we've done under the business skills, under the qualifications and business skills tab is we've updated recently last week, our website page, and we've put in a little section called updates and webinars. You can see a screenshot of that on the left. You can see upcoming webinars, which is today's and the link to it. And then you can see updates uh, and um, webinar events, uh, as well as our newsletters. And you can see under the updates is the recording of the previous witness testimony dispensation webinar that we did. So please go back onto our website if you missed that witness testimony dispensation webinar and listen via YouTube, approximately 45 minutes, something like. And we do go through an awful lot of the Q&A with the frequently asked questions. You also see on that web page as well, um, upcoming webinars, and there will be um, every webinar now that we do will also be up there as well in the future, as well as all the newsletters we put out. So you can see at the very bottom, the three newsletters over the last couple of years that we've done, which will update and inform you of future progression within the business skills portfolio. Okay, now I'm going to touch upon the work-based project support. The first things we did here in order to give you some feedback was co contact uh, one of the lead independent endpoint assessors for their feedback. And um, this is really, really valuable. Um, they see it uh, day in, day out, and they get the positives and the negatives from, from endpoint assessment. So what we're going to do is have a look, a brief look at the feedback. Um, so we appreciate that within that project proposal, there is now a maximum of 500 words. It used to be 250, and we booked it to 500. We still appreciate the fact that the 500 word count is limiting, but within that 500 word proposal, the apprentice must showcase their idea the best they can within that 500 words. The IEPA can see the potential in the project idea. If there isn't any potential in that project idea, if it doesn't have the potential to map across to all the KSBs, then it will be rejected. Make sure then that you've used the work-based skills as a checklist on the proposal to check that it's going to meet all of those areas within that standard. And I'm going to use a link here. Hopefully it should take me back to a previous uh, page that I mentioned previously. So I said I'd come back to this page. These are the knowledge and skills that are associated to the work-based projects. You'll notice that there's no behaviors whatsoever. So the work-based projects must show evidence against all those knowledge and all those areas of skills. Okay, so I'm going to try and go back to where we were. Within that proposal then, you need to make sure that all those uh, areas that we've just seen on the previous slide are embedded into that project proposal. So will that project proposal cover all of those areas? So a bit more of a feedback from the from one of our lead independent assessors then is that many apprentices are not actually suitable. Uh, sorry, their job role is not actually suitable and doesn't actually have the scope to actually meet that criteria. So quite often that's down to recruitment. And the fact that within that actual job role that the apprentice is doing is not going to lend itself to cover the case fees accordingly. So please make sure then where possible that the actual job role that the apprentice is going into is suitable and will provide the correct evidence to map across to all the three key assessment areas, not just the projects. We've also seen lots of projects being based on a complaint, one complaint, and then that complaint is then pulled apart uh, and, 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 and a project is created around it. It's not sufficient to just pull a complaint apart and say why it happened. It has to be looking at the wider range of all many complaints together. So what are the complaints? Is there a trend that's forming? What is that trend that's forming? 
how are you going how is the apprentice going to address that trend uh, how what is it that they're going to put in place to stop those specific complaints and, and and basically how are they going to execute it and what are the issues explore those trends and themes etc that are coming out of a number of complaints we've also found then uh, that um, where the learner only has internal customers it's making it very difficult for the apprentice um, to actually meet the, the criteria the KSP is associated so where possible we would strongly recommend that the learner has external customers it might be that they have a mix of internal customers and external customers we do appreciate that some job roles do have just internal customers but it really is so important that a skill scan is done at the very beginning to make sure that the um, the apprentice is going to still have the the chance to meet all those ksps even if it's an internal customer because what we are seeing currently is that it's making life very difficult for the apprentice to 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 create that evidence okay so moving on back to the the project proposal if that project proposal is rejected the center must make sure that they've taken the IEPA feedback on board. So if the project is um, is rejected for whatever reason, it will have feedback attached to it, okay? So it's really imperative then that the new project proposal that's put forward is taken the, the feedback on board, adapted, and then resubmitted. What we have seen in the past is a project proposal submitted, and regardless of whether it's accepted or rejected, the learners then got on and done that project. And because the feedback has not been taken on board, that project has actually led to a fail. So make sure that the learner does not start that project until the proposal has been accepted. If the proposal fails, the feedback is taken on board first. The, pro the pro project proposal is then reworded, rewitted, rewritten, resubmitted, and once accepted, the project can then start. If it's found that the project has been started before the proposal, or indeed, before Gateway, then the project will fail. It's very clear in the assessment plan from IFATE that the project cannot start until after Gateway and the project proposal needs to be signed off first. So, uh, what we've just mentioned that if a project is started prior to the proposal being accepted, it will fail. A project proposal also benefits from being cross-referenced to the KSPs. Now, the IEPAs or the LEAPAs, whoever take on the project themselves, will see the potential in the project. If you've mapped that project proposal out already and clearly identified where it maps across to all the work-based areas, the knowledge and the skills, then the job is done and you know yourself before you submitted it that you cross-referenced it accordingly that it's got the potential and the scope to map across it's going to be a success so this is an exa uh, an example actually the screenshot of uh, an example project proposal and how it's embedded those knowledge and skills those work-based skills into the project proposal now it is only a screenshot okay however in the future we will be giving out uh, in the very near future. We have had some uh, exemplar support resources built. And so we will be making sure that these are available to you in the very near future. And I'll touch upon that more uh, in a little bit. Okay. Choosing that project is often quite difficult, but it's really important that centers, private training providers, support the apprentice to consider the following questions. So it's almost, again, a tripartite three-way agreement, but uh, an informal one, um, where you're all discussing the following areas. So will the project allow the apprentice to meet the, the requirements of the knowledge and skills that we've mentioned within the standard? What will be the impact of the project on both internal and external customers? And can meaningful research be gathered to support that particular project? Is it realistic? Is it going to fail? Is it going to be a success? Is it too big or too small? If it's too big, then that's going to be a potential issue in itself. The apprentice has only got two months to complete the project. Okay, so if it's extremely big, the putting is putting pressure on the, the apprentice from the start to, 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 to complete it within that time frame. 
can the recommendations from the project be implemented and is the project to pro project topic suitable now if the project actually fails it doesn't necessarily mean to say that the uh, so if the project is implemented and actually it wasn't that much of a success only certain parts of it were um or or it perhaps wasn't as as, as good as we thought it wasn't effective as we thought it doesn't necessarily mean to say that the learner is going to fail the uh, project method of assessment. OK, but so it's about the, assess the, the feedback from that project. Why did it fail or why was it not completely successful? OK, so providing that the project is implemented, if it then fails or is not quite as successful as the learner thought, that will not mean that the project fails, providing that the learner feeds back accordingly and then puts something in place to say what they would have done differently in the future. But the project must be implemented, that's the key. Okay, so we do have examples of potential projects available. Um, projects essentially must be customer focused and based on an area of work that the apprentice is engaged with. So which is why it's really important to, to, dis to, to discuss with the employer, their line manager, and of course the centre, the college or the PTP that they are they are under. So does the project cover a specific high level challenge? And it's the term high level challenge that's important because that is, is, is clear within the EPA pack and the assessment plan. So does it cover a specific high level challenge that the apprentice has dealt with, explaining what it was that happened or is going to happen, what actions were there, uh, what planning and execution happened, what solutions were offered, and what were the details of any recommendations made to change a policy or a process, and any feedback, of course, from, from customers themselves. So going back to the details of recommendations made to change a policy or process, it might be that, the, that a new policy or process was implemented, it wasn't quite a success, and that's where the learner would feedback to make further recommendations of how to improve it further for the future. There is also a potential projects list which is available. However, it's no, no point looking down the potential projects list if none of them actually map across to the employer's uh, job role or place of work. So it's clear it's, it, it's important then that the, the project itself should be based on an area of work that the apprentice is engaged with, not just the fact that they, they like a particular project title within a sheet or an example that we've given you. So there are examples um, available of potential projects. Um, and we'll show, I'll show you later on where um, that can be accessed. So I'm going to move on now to the process, uh, the project process timeline. The employer and provider need to work closely with the apprentice to select a project. There's no point the provider and the apprentice working together if it's then not going to be able to be fulfilled or implemented within the employer's premises or that particular job role. So it's really, really important that the employer and provider, along with the apprentice, work closely together. Within that timeline, the apprentice then needs to complete the document, the work-based project proposal form. That is located within the EPA recording forms document and that's the form then where the actual projects will be highlighted within 500 words and that's where we'd expect to see the particular project proposal mapped across to the, the work-based skills, the criteria, the knowledge and the skills associated to the project uh, like that screenshot um, I showed you before highlighted. So that proposal then should be no more than 500 words. Make sure that you've got approval from the employer that the project proposal is fit for purpose, that it could actually be implemented. And it's the provider's responsibility to check that proposal along with the apprentice to make sure that that proposal has sufficient scope to meet all the case fees. So where the provider's strengths are is that they know the assessment plan. Where the employer's strengths are is that they know the job role. And that's why it's really important that the two come together and make sure that the apprentice can implement that particular job, sorry, that particular project. Once that happens, 
it would then be submitted to city and guilds. Now, the project proposal needs to be submitted. So does the gateway documentation, so does the functional skills evidence, et cetera, et cetera. The project proposal will only be looked at once gateway is successfully passed. So once the apprentice successfully goes through gateway, you will get confirmation that gateway has been successful and that the, 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 the EPA team has, has, has um, accepted the functional skills evidence and has accepted the gateway declaration form. Once you received that um, information from the EPA team, that is when the EPA team will forward the project proposal to the IE for saying this particular apprentice is successful through Gateway. Please look at the project proposal. The IE will then feed back on that project proposal, uh, saying whether or not it is appropriate or not. City and Guilds will confirm then to the customer if the submission has or has not been approved. And the key here is that if it has approved, the project can start, but not until you've received approval. If the project proposal has failed, you will receive feedback from the IEPA as to why it's not appropriate. You then need to, to, to take the amendments, the feedback on board and resubmit the project proposal. Only until you receive acceptance of that project proposal can the apprentice then actually start the project. And I know I keep mentioning that, but it's really, really important. OK, so as I've just mentioned, the apprentice can't start the project until it, approval is received. We've also got to stress as well is that where the apprentice works for the same employer, they must ensure that the project is their own and clearly demonstrates what their responsibilities or tasks are, for instance. We've got to bear in mind that the apprentice has only got two months to complete that project, uh, and therefore that's why the size of the project is important. Again, like we mentioned before, the project can be too big in the same way that the project can be too small. And if the project is too small, it's less likely to cover all the case fees. Once the project has then been completed, that's the time when the learner would then create a project report. That report is of 2,500 words and again has a 10% tolerance. The apprentice can put in an appendices if they wish, um, but it all everything, all the evidence that goes into that must be um, appropriate and linked to the KSBs. And again, like with the portfolio, that report must be submitted no later than two weeks prior to end point assessment. Now, we do have, before I go on to the further support, we do have um, guidance around the report on how the learner, an exemplar of how the learner can set out that report. So if your learner has been registered already, please do look on our smart screen tab, log into our smart screen with the login that you've given on registration of that particular learner. And that will then give you access to a number of documents within the EPA preparation tab under customer service specialist. And that will highlight to the learner an exemplar of how to lay out that particular project. Now, some new resources are on the horizon and I've screenshot some of them there. These are really, really tailored towards a particular project and fantastic resources that are just around the corner. They are just to get signed off by our quality department and then they will be uploaded again to our smart screen platform under the endpoint assessment preparation tab, again under customer service specialist, which once again, you will get access to once you've registered your learners. So it's a dedicated work-based project support materials and they will consist of a planning document which is like a checklist. There is some tutor guidance there about how to carry out the project, and then there is an overview. And within that guidance and that overview, it actually incorporates two new full exemplar project proposals. So it's really, really worthwhile registering your learners onto um, the endpoint assessment, onto 949412, 
just to get access to these specific resources uh, for the project. Reading those exemplar project proposals will really give you an idea within 500 words of what a learner needs to put down on that proposal and how they've mapped the work-based skills to that project proposal. So just to reiterate, you get this on registration of the learner and it falls on, it sits on our smart screen uh, platform under the EPA preparation resource tab. Along with that, you will also get other resources. You've got the preparation tool itself and you've got other resources there, exemplar resources, which guide you around the uh, observation for when that comes back into action the portfolio, etc. Okay, what we're going to do now is open up um, to questions. Now, we've got Mandy on the line, who is uh, a lead industry manager, and myself. We've got the questions tab, uh, which you should be able to have access to. And hopefully, we will have some questions on there, uh, which we, we can now look at. If um, we do not answer your question, or if you have a question as to later date, feel free to, 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 to email me. Uh, my email was on the very first uh, page, dominic.green at cityandguild.com. And um, what will happen is we'll put together frequently asked questions and post it on our, web, on our website with the recording of this particular webinar. So we'll look at some questions now. First question uh, from Julie. Hi, is this being recorded and sent out? It won't be sent out, Julie, but what will happen is um, it is being recorded. I will then um, download the recording, which does take some time. It then needs to be uploaded to our web page by our digital marketing uh, team, and it will sit on that web page that I showed you previously, our new web page under qualifications, business skills, updates and webinars so all our recorded webinars uh, will be, um, uh, be be uploaded to that particular area uh, one of our colleagues Rebecca is also on the line and she said if she can offer any support with uh, particular EPA questions she's more than happy to help as well who signs uh, Hazel's put who signs gateway documents in the event of redundancy that's a very good question Hazel what we'll do there is we'll perhaps go to uh, IFAC to seek clarification. Um, oh, do you want we'll... to answer that one? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mandy. If you've got the answer, I'll ask Rebecca just to clarify. Um, ideally, where possible, um, we would like an email from the employer just confirming the termination um, date of the apprenticeship because we, d we have to check that the learners have been on programme for the right length of time. Um, so we have to report that back to IFAC. Um, but also we'd need them to put the address, um, put the train provider's address in the employer details in Wall Garden if this is possible. So I hope that helps, Hazel. Thanks, Wendy. So a question from uh, Helen. How does the observation work if the learner only deals with customers on the telephone? The, if, if you're talking about face-to-face um, -face observation and um, uh, in the old world where we actually carried out observations face-to-face -face before COVID came, before COVID hit, uh, what would happen is the IEPA would, uh, would go to the workplace and they would expect access to a dual headset uh, where they can listen in uh, to make sure that um, what's been said basically by the customer uh, and how the, the, the apprentice responds to that. So they must have access really to listen in on both ends to make sure that they can hear the full conversation. If they don't have full access, then obviously it's been detrimental to the apprentice because they're not hearing the full conversation. So uh, um, it really does need to have dual access. There's lots of questions around the portfolio based professional discussion and the, and the mentioning of the minimum 10 pieces and maximum 15 pieces of evidence. Um, what constitutes one piece of work? And, and, and it's quite a difficult question because you could argue that one email constitutes one piece of evidence. And that's, um, or you could argue that an email is the product evidence off the back of a, um, a, a, 
uh, an observation or a reflective account and that is backing that reflective account up for instance um, Monday, am I right in thinking then that an email back, that's backing up, say, an observation or a reflective account would actually only be classed as one piece of evidence? I think what you'd have to be careful of there, John, is what we've experienced is if you look at the assessment plan, it, it talks about the on-programme portfolio. However, what, what we are looking for with regards to um, the submission is obviously um example pieces like the best of the best which covers the criteria so we wouldn't be looking for the whole of the on program now one of the things we have um encountered is folders within folders within folders and reams of evidence that wouldn't be acceptable so we have there is a, um, a guide around portfolios which is available and what you know sort of maximum evidence and sort of hints and tips really so um you know certainly look at that but ideally and that's why they put it in the assessment plan 15 pieces because really they do you know um they don't want reams and reams so you have to just really carefully think about what you are submitting and look for something that could be submitted as holistic evidence where you might round everything up into one piece and get the employee to sign it um so you know really look at that because if, if you the assessor has to go through folders and folders and folders which is quite time consuming but in a lot of cases the evidence isn't relevant to the criteria that's required for that that epa component thanks Randy. appreciate it um okay what have we got uh kate how long do they get to resubmit the project proposal and is there a limit to how many times it can be sub resubmitted uh morning kate um Essentially, there's not a time frame um, apart from you need to complete EPA within six months of having gone through Gateway. So you 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 really need to obviously try and uh, resubmit as soon as possible. But the key here really is is not necessarily to rush it, but to make sure that the feedback is taken on board from the IEPA um, and that it, it, it's making sure that it's clear that that has happened. And that the can, I just, post can I just add in there too. as well on that? And one of the things yeah. that you have to be mindful of is that the project needs to be completed within two months of actually starting the endpoint assessment. So once you go forward and you submit your gateway evidence, um, you know, you that is the time that the clock starts. Once that's accepted, that's the time that the clock starts ticking around the EPA. So what we would say is once you've received that feedback from the IEPA with the recommendations um, for what they would expect to see in the proposal, we really would recommend that you start, you submit that as, you know, as soon as possible, so that then once that's approved, the learner can start on the project. Thanks, Monday. Okay, so uh, when, uh, what happens if the project isn't implemented? Well, if it isn't implemented, Ryan, um, it probably gives the apprentices less of a chance to, to actually achieve all the KSBs associated to that particular project. Um, so it's not that it's a definite fail necessarily, but obviously it, it, it's highly likely that they would struggle. So we'd really suggest that if the project isn't implemented, that the proposal in the first place isn't perhaps up to scratch. It might be that, 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 um, that, that um, other factors have, implement, have, have affected that. It might be that the project was due to be implemented, but the employers suddenly uh, made redundancies or has had uh, cost implications, so therefore hasn't got any money to implement that project. If that's the case, then the learner needs to do the best they can as far as recommendations is concerned. Um, and obviously that, that's extenuating circumstances, but where possible, the project really does need to be implemented because obviously it will give that learner that better opportunity of achieving a pass or a distinction. Okay, let's have a look at a couple more. So Mark has said, can the evidence provided for the portfolio be digital, such as recorded discussions and observations? And the answer to that, Mark, is yes, it can. What you've got to be aware of, though, is the, the, the size of the files that that's going to create. So um, if it's going to be too much, you're going to really struggle to upload to the e-portal at the very end. Um, 
we've got to be careful then of if we're doing lots and lots of recordings, um, if it's going to be amounting to more than say 250 meg, we're really going to struggle to upload it to the portal. Uh, so please be aware, be mindful of that. Also, what I would say is that if you are doing digital recordings such as observations or uh, uh, professional discussions, for instance, is that you timestamp them as well uh, so that the IEPA can, can locate that evidence um, easily. So Alana said, how do we submit the proposal for the project? The proposal would be done on the proposal project form which is incorporated within the um, recording form centers. Uh, it's a Word document uh, and it's available on, on, on the website under 9494 documents and you would look, look, load that to the portal, um, which will then be looked at once uh, an IEPA, once Gateway is passed an IEPA and an IEPA is signed, assigned. Okay. Um, Jeremy's put, how does completing the task books fit into the showcase portfolio? The task books are great, Jeremy. They're fantastic at uh, giving underpinning knowledge and they're a great starting point to teach the knowledge skills behaviors for the actual learners. What I would say is because uh, at level three, we're expecting uh, a higher set, a higher level um, amount of evidence is that perhaps the evidence, the, the task book should be started as a, a, a starting point as a stepping stone and from that it might be that you that the learner the apprentice actually generates better evidence within the workplace which would then supersede the task book evidence so they're a great starting point and if they are producing the best that the learner has actually achieved then you may put that forward but what we don't want to see is obviously just a completed uh, training manual or task book put forward as a showcase portfolio they are there very much as a, a, a stepping stone, uh, as a great starting point to teach them the knowledge, skills and behaviours to then go into the workplace and generate the evidence. We've got to remember that there's a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 15 pieces of evidence. And actually, we're only putting forward the best and that evidence really should be holistic. So actually, the task books might not generate the best of that particular learner but be a great starting point. So it's about what's ger ger generated over on program duration. Okay, Wendy says, why is the witness testimony discussion conducted with the apprentice and not the actual witness? It's there to confirm competence, Wendy. So it's about the apprentice um, giving evidence uh, to the IEPA to make sure that they are giving up, they, they understand what it is that's gone into the witness testimony. Otherwise, the witness could actually write down anything whatsoever, uh, which might not have happened. We're not saying that they would, but it's about confirming that competence um, from the learner that what the witness has put down within that witness testimony actually happened and that they understand what it is that they've put down. So John has said, do we need to register on endpoint assessment to access the exemplar projects or can we access them before? So you do get access to uh, all the exemplar materials, including the new stuff that I've put on today once they are quality checked, uh, that I've screenshot today. Once they're quality checked, they will be put up to the endpoint assessment preparation tab on smart screen. However, you can't access them before you registered the learner. So once you've registered your learner on 9494-12, you'll then be given a login to Smart Screen, which will give you access to everything, John. So within there, you'll get access to the preparation tool and you'll get access to all the exemplar stuff, including uh, eventually the exemplar projects documentation that I've screenshot today. It won't, it's just around the corner. It's simply a case of getting it uh, quality checked in the next week or two, and then it being uploaded to the um, the preparation tool area on Smart Screen. But you cannot access it unless you register a learner. Do you want me to take a question from Lisa, Dom? Yeah, around, I've not got that. Um, so Lisa asked around, can, can we start the project um, 
they can't sell a project until the proposal is accepted, will they be able to use customers' feedback and complaints data that will be gathered from the previous six to 12 months? Yes, absolutely, Lisa. I think the thing with this is they've only got two months to complete the project. What we wouldn't be looking for is where the project has been started and it's evident that that has been worked on before um, the proposal has been accepted. But yes, we would expect them to look at data, go back, look at logs, speak to colleagues, and really collate as much feedback as they can in order to put forward recommendations um, and improvements. So yes, absolutely. Thanks, Wendy. Um, just looking through now. So Siraj has said to clarify two months from approval of proposal or from date on Gateway December. So the learner, the apprentice has two months, like Mandy said previously, once they've gone through Gateway, the learner has two months then to complete the project. So within that time frame, you would put in a, a, a proposal, a project proposal form, um, hopefully it would be accepted, and then the apprentice has two months to complete they would then complete, they would then do um, EPA uh, after that. Okay, I'm looking at time now. Um, we've got time for uh, a couple more. Uh, John's put, is the project required only for level three learners? Yeah, each, each standard will highlight what uh, assessment criteria it is that they're using. The customer service specialist only has a project Customer service practitioner level two uh, does not incorporate a specific project uh, as part of endpoint assessment. That's not to say, John, that they can't carry out a project within uh, their um, within their own program and use that as evidence within their showcase portfolio. Okay. So Rebecca's just said, uh, can I just say when they are uploading the project proposal? Uh, so Rebecca is our EPA partnership manager. Rebecca said, can I just say when the, when customers are uploading their project proposal, can they email into the EPA team to confirm this has been done so they can assign an EPA as soon as possible? Um, what we're trying to do uh, is keep to, uh, Rebecca says we can keep to a three-day SLA to do a check-in on it. So we're trying to keep to a three-day SLA agreement around the project proposal, but please do remember that project proposals will only be assigned to an IEPA uh, once Gateway has been successful. So once Gateway has been completed, uh, uh, an IEPA will then be assigned to that project proposal and within three days after Gateway has been completed, look at that project proposal and feed back to the centre as to whether or not it was a, uh, uh, accepted or rejected. Okay, thanks for that, Rebecca. Much appreciated. Uh, Caroline, so last question then. Um, if you, Caroline, if you start Gateway and proposal is rejected, when does the two month period start? Is the rejection period? Yes, okay, so we've just gone through that as well. Um, so the two month period does start uh, once you've gone through Gateway. So it's important really that the, the project, if it's, if it's rejected, is amended in line with the IEPA feedback straight away and sent back to to the EPA team for um, uh, to, to be reassessed by the uh, independent endpoint assessor. I'm conscious there are a few more questions that we haven't had time to answer. What we will do then is uh, is take these away. Um, we'll also perhaps get uh, the lead independent endpoint assessor involved as well uh, and and answer all the questions that you've put up today. Uh, Put them onto a Word document, and what we'll do is I'll send them to our digital marketing team and upload them as a PDF online to that web page uh, URL that I showed you before, um, along with the recorded presentation from today. Um, anybody uh, who has any further questions, like I said, please feel free to email me dominic.green at cityandgills.com um, and we'll add those to the question banks. So from Mandy and myself, I uh, would just like to say thank you for, for logging in today. Uh, we appreciate your time and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you in the future. So please do look out for any focus alert updates. Um, look out the recorded webinar 
uh, and, and lastly, stay safe. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Mandy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dom.